and just got back from the minister's conference. All throughout the week, we were gone Monday through Friday in Colorado, um, just being, being ministered to ourselves. How many of you know pastors being ministered to as well? <laughs> so uh, regardless of what common belief is in the church, you know, pastors are not super spiritual. You know, we, we face the same things everybody else does in life. And uh, anyways, it's good to, to get away for a little bit and to, you know, get re-energized and, and be ministered to. Praise God. So thank you, Lord. Um, let's see. First off, what I want to say is about the Wednesday night Bible studies that we have going on. I just want to uh, add, a little bit, uh, add a little bit to that, okay, to encourage you to come on Wednesday nights. And it's not because we're looking for attendance or we're looking for numbers or anything like that. You know, this is not for us, it's for you. Amen? Amen. We have these classes on Wednesday nights to be a blessing to you. And regardless of what we do in life, the only thing that matters is fulfilling the will of God and doing what he's called us to do. If we don't do that, We've wasted our life. It doesn't matter how many good things we've done, you know. It, even, it doesn't even matter for, for us, you know, how many, in the, in the big picture, I'm talking about how many people we've led to the Lord or, you know, anything like that. Because we can do a lot of works in the name of Jesus. And, and Jesus will say to you, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I, I never knew you. Right? We can prophesy in his name and, and work all these miracles and and, and praise God, that will bless other people. I'm not saying it's for absolutely nothing. It'll, it'll bless them. But the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, you can give all you have to the poor, and, and without love, you're nothing. So even if you give all, all, you know, everything to the poor without love, I mean, it is blessing the poor, but without love, it, it means nothing for you. And so what I want to encourage you is, you know, I don't want anybody in here to, to go to heaven. And uh, God questioned you on, on what your calling was you know, what you do with your life. And then you say, well, Lord, I just, you know, I didn't know. I didn't know. And the Lord's going to tell you, you remember at Vision Church when they had that teaching on Wednesday nights about finding God's will? And God's going to tell us we're without excuse. Amen? I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm, I'm really not. I don't believe in that. I don't believe in scare tactics in church and things like that. But, you know, I mean, this is serious, and this, this is real. God is going to question us when we stand before him. What did you do with your life? Not just did you do good things, but did you do what I called you to do? Amen? And uh, the only reason I'm saying that to you is because, uh, you know, I've received that for myself as well. I take that very seriously for myself is, is what has God called me to do? What has he called me to be? And, and look, it's not about all of us being, you know, in full-time ministry or, or preaching or going out and being a missionary. You know, so maybe what God has called you to do is, is to raise up your Christian family and, and to, you know, work a secular job, and that's completely fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Amen? Um, there's nothing, you know, worse or better about that than there is with, you know, being a, a minister or a pastor or a missionary or an evangelist. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. We're all called to different things. But the main thing is, are we, are we, do we know that we're doing what we're called to do? Amen? And that's what's really important. So I want to encourage you to come on Wednesday nights. You know, these Wednesday classes that we do, um, they're to bless you. They're to bless you. And they're they're to help you experience God's best for your life. That's really what our heart here is at Vision Church, is to, to help you to experience God's best. And we want to equip you in every way possible to do that, you know. So, um, anyways, I just encourage you to come be blessed. If you can't make it, we understand, you know, work and things like that. Um, we do put it on our, our YouTube channel and also on Facebook. We put all the sermons there from Wednesday nights there. that You can catch it there. So, if you can't come, I understand. You know, some people have other priorities and different work hours. We totally understand that, but, um, you know, do what you, do what you can to, to put the word first, because the word is what really matters, and, and you can listen to that when you're at home or out and about or whatever, like I said, on YouTube or something. Amen? Praise God. So I hope that blesses you and encourages you. Um, second thing that I want to quickly mention here is, how many of y'all know that we have our midterm elections coming up? Yeah. How many of y'all vote? Don't you don't have to raise your hand, okay? But how many of y'all vote, right? You're a part of, well, I'm going to raise my hand because I'm, you know, but I just don't want to leave anybody out who doesn't vote. <laughs> but we have a tremendous responsibility, brothers and sisters, as Christians to vote in this nation. And, you know, there's, there's been this thing for too long that Christians don't get involved in politics. 
And that's why we're where we're at today in America, is because Christians thought that we shouldn't get involved in politics. And um, I just want to encourage you, we have a responsibility. Amen? It's not, we're not trying to get all political and everything. We're standing up for God, and we're standing up for righteousness. And it's about time we start standing up and voting. If evangelicals voted, you know, man, we would be so far ahead than where we are right now. Amen? But so many evangelicals are just staying at home. Well, you know, we're not going to change the world through the government. We're going to change the world through going out and ministering on the streets. Yeah, that's true. But look at where the world is today because of government and the laws that are being passed. Amen? So let me go over here real quickly to Proverbs 14.34. Proverbs 13.44. And they, they, I don't think they have it up there on the screen. Um, but that's okay. I surprised them. I didn't let them know. <laughs> I should have. Okay, Proverbs 14, 34. It says here, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. This is huge. Righteousness exalts a nation, uh, but sin is a reproach to any people. And so, you know, we need to be voting in righteousness. Amen? And there, there's, there's no perfect candidate for anything, but nevertheless, we need to be, uh, uh, you know, getting in righteousness in, in offices. Praise God in small governments and big governments here, here in America. Now, I want to let you know that uh, Tuesday, October 9th, is the last day to register to vote. And um, you can go to, to votetexas.gov, and you can you know, figure out there where the polls are and, and uh, where, uh, or how you get registered and things like that. So you can go to votetexas.gov. Uh, last day to register is Tuesday, October 9th. So, yeah, this Tuesday, yeah, so here in a couple days. So that's the last day to register. And uh, the early voting will, of course, be Monday, October 22nd through Friday, November 2nd. And then uh, the general election is uh, November 6th, okay, Tuesday, November 6th. So now we are going to have um, some information in the back. We don't have it right now, but um, coming up here, we are going to have some information in the back on the candidates that are running for different things so that you can be aware of what you're of who you're voting for and why you're voting for them. Amen. So I want to encourage you to vote smart and not listen to the media because the media's got an agenda and it's not a godly agenda. Amen. You have to be smart for yourself. You have to think for yourself. Praise God. It's just like here in church. You know, when I preach, I don't expect you to just gobble up everything I say. I want you to go home and study the word and say, is, pa is what pastor's saying true? And we need to do that as well with the different people that are running for candidacy. Amen. In different areas. So again, we're not trying to get all political. This is what God has instructed us to do: is to, is to, you know, yeah, our kingdom is not of this world, right? It's, it's beyond. Amen. I mean, our, our, our home forever is to be with the Lord, and this, this, the, the kingdom and the, the government of this world is going to, is, is going to fade away. Did you have a question? Yeah. You gotta humble yourself. <laughs> you gotta humble yourself. So we're not gonna tell you who to vote for. Um, that's up to you. But we just encourage you to vote according to the godly principles that God has laid out in His Word. And that's as simple as that. And um, praise God. So I, I do want to. I do want to quickly add to that. Okay, and then we'll get into the message. But I do want to quickly add to that that if we don't think God is while we're here on this earth, even though it's a temporal government and everything, while we're here on this earth. God is calling us to effect change in this world. And how many of you know that sin, what it does is it hardens the heart. Sin is deceitful, right? And so if we have ungodly men and women in offices, what are, they're promoting sin. And what is that doing? That's hardening hearts. And what does that do for us as ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ? It makes it harder for us to get the word to people. Okay, so if you don't think government affects the spiritual, you're wrong. It does affect the spiritual. And so I want to encourage you to, to you know, vote in godly people. That way, um, morality, not just morality, but, God, but godliness and Jesus Christ. Man, I remember when I preached at, uh, not preached, but I kind of did preach, but <laughs> at my high school graduation, they told me I couldn't use the name of Jesus. What is that? I can't use the name of Jesus at my high school, you know, graduation ceremony. But it don't matter because God gave me wisdom anyways and Praise God, I blessed them. They knew who I was talking about. Didn't even say Jesus, but they knew who I was talking about. Jesus got different names in the Bible. Amen? 
Um, so you can't stop me, praise God. But, I mean, what is, it, what is up with this, you know, free speech thing? I mean, that's just crazy, isn't it? But anyways, so um, that's about as far as I'll go with that. Like I said, in the, in the coming weeks, we'll have uh, information out there for you guys on, on each candidate running for what. And that'll, you know, help you. And, and you guys can go home as well and do your own research on the different candidates running. So you can be prepared at least by November 6th to vote accordingly. Amen? So let's be a blessing. Let's go and, and affect change, not just talk to people about Jesus, and that's great. We need to do that. But let's also affect change by voting in godly people. Hallelujah. All right. Okay, enough of that. Let's go ahead and get into the word of God today. You guys excited? Amen. Amen. I am excited too. I got to hurry up because I got some good stuff to share. Um, so, so here we go. Father God, we thank you for this morning. What a blessing it is to be here. This is the day that you have made. We rejoice and we are glad in it. Uh, we thank you for loving us, being with us, never leaving us, never forsaking us, never forgetting us. God, you are so awesome. And we thank you that this morning wisdom is going to be added to us. We thank you for courage, for boldness this morning to go out and to make good decisions and to be a blessing to everyone we come in contact with in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're going to take a little break, um, a one-week break from our series on talking about the blessing and the cursing, okay? The reason for that is Brother Frank and his family are on a vacation, a uh, well-deserved vacation. They, man, they're, they're just always, always running around. So it's good that they, you know, get to go off and have some family time. And, and uh, because of that, we're going to have the youth sit in today. And so I'm not seeing the youth, but that's okay. So I figured we'd take a little break if we did have youth, and uh, we'd have a message here today that I think would, would be a blessing to everybody. Amen? So uh, the title of today's message is Making Good Decisions. Making good decisions. This is important, isn't it? Making good decisions in life. Hallelujah. And you know, the good thing about making good decisions is no matter in the past if you've made a bunch of bad decisions or a bunch of good decisions, how many of you know today is a new day? The mercies of God are new today. And you have a choice every single time that a decision is presented to you, you have a choice to make either a bad or a good one. And that, that good one can lead to another good one, can lead to another good one. Amen? And so if you've been making a bunch of bad decisions, uh, you know, you, you can just cut it off right now and start making good decisions. One step at a time. So that's the good news. Let's go over here to Ephesians 5.8. Ephesians 5.8. I think it's interesting that Jill was uh, teaching from Ephesians 5 because she kind of finished the section that I was going to go through. So that's when you know... The Holy Spirit is working. Amen. Okay, Ephesians 5.8. Here we are. Here we are. Thank you, Lord. It says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth finding out what is acceptable to the Lord and having no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Uh, therefore, he says, Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Hallelujah. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. So today, when it comes to good decision making, we are going to be talking and highlighting uh, the words wisdom and light. Wisdom and light. And how they are interconnected there. Okay. So the first thing that I want to mention, I want to focus on this last portion that we just read there, this last chunk here. And it says in verse 17, it says, therefore, do not be unwise. Do not be unwise. Now, that word unwise, it can also be translated from the Greek, meaning mindless. Okay, do not be mindless. In other words, um, do not be ignorant of the will of God because of our ego, Thinking that we have it all together. Thinking that, you know, God, thank you for your grace here, but I think I got it from here on out. I can handle this. 
And, and listen, we always need to be relying on the grace of God, even when we think or feel like we can handle something in our own strength. Even when we think or feel like we know the right way to go, or the right decision to make, we always need to be relying and looking to the grace of God in our life. Amen? Don't ever let your ego get in the way of, of you being mindful of the will of God. Okay, so do not be unwise. Do not be mindless of the will of God. Praise God. So, you know, and sometimes, too, we're, we're so concerned about fulfilling our will, right? Sometimes we can get caught up in the busyness of life that we, we, you know, we forget what God's will is, what, what decision God wants us to make, because we're over here, you know, uh, counting our pros and cons, and we're, we're over here trying to figure out, naturally speaking, you know, what's the best decision to, to make, and what, what do I do here, what do I do there, and we're just trying to, we're, we're trying to come up with the answers in our own flesh, in our own wisdom, right? And, and God did, gave us a brain for a reason, to think. <laughs> okay, so I'm not saying don't use your brain, but what I am saying is that don't rely on your brain. Don't have faith in your brain. Don't trust in your brain because your brain is so limited. You don't know what's to come. Amen? We don't know what one decision is going to lead to. We can think it'll lead to something, but we have no idea, right? And there's a lot of people who get married. At the beginning of that marriage, I'm sure, you know, on their wedding day, they're thinking, man, this is so great. My spouse is so awesome. And, you know, they make that decision to get married. And then two years later, six months, even six months later, two weeks later, <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> Amen? So, well, it's too late now. You're married. Praise God. You can come to church and get right. <laughs> Hallelujah. Make it work. Thank you, Jesus. Love can be a choice. Hallelujah. But... Uh, so many times we just, you know, we try to figure out, uh, you know, we're so, we're so obsessed with and distracted by our will and what we want that we never consider what does God want? What is God's will? What is God directing me to do? Am I relying on his grace? We need to ask ourselves that when it comes to decision making. Amen? So it says there, do not, therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of of the Lord is. This is so huge. God wants us to understand what his will is. You know, I mean, if you go to church, if you go to a religious church, uh, and I'm not trying to put churches down, but if you go to a religious church, they're going to tell you, well, the Lord works in mysterious ways. You just never know what his will is. You just never know what God's going to cook up today. No, the Bible says you're unwise. You are mindless if you don't understand what God's will is. I'm not saying that to condemn anybody if you're not sure what God's will is. I've been in positions where I'm not sure what his will is. But let's have faith in God. Let's push and press to know and understand what his will is. God says, I want you to understand what my will is for your life. And that is wisdom. Amen. God is calling, up, calling us out of ignorance into wisdom, into understanding what his will is. Thank you, Lord. Now that word understand there, it can also be translated from the Greek to put together. To put together. So therefore, do not be mindless, but, but put together what the will of God is. It's like, a, it's like a puzzle. Amen? It's like you're putting pieces together uh, of what God's will is for your life. And, and, you know, we need to trust in God's grace to put that puzzle together because there's no way we're going to know what God's will is apart from him. Amen? We need to trust in the Lord. And sometimes God will just give you one puzzle piece of his will. And we have to be, to have, to have faith in God that he's going to make everything work out together for our good if we follow him. Amen? If we love him and we're called, not according to our, you know, our, our, our purpose, but according to his will, according to his purpose. Brothers and sisters, we need to stop living according to our purpose. What is his purpose for our life? What is his will for our life? God says, I will take care of all your needs. Some of us think that if I don't take care of my needs, who will? God says he will. If you trust God and, and are kingdom-minded, you'll get out of that cycle of working pay, working pay, and you're just wasting your life away. And that's why some people are depressed because they feel like they're not doing anything. You know, and God wants us to understand, to be mindful of what his will is, to put together what his will is. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. How do we put together the will of God?
for our life, to make good decisions in life, to be mindful of what the Lord wants, not just what we want, but what he wants. Amen? And sometimes that can be one and the same. When you're spending time with the Lord, you know, his will can be uh, your will. Amen? When you're spending time with him, your, your mind is being renewed to the truth, and, and, and God places his desires inside of you. So sometimes your, your will and his will can be the same, but sometimes it's not, because your flesh is like, nah, let's go do this. You know, let's, let's go out and let's go watch TV, or let's go, let's go out to the movies, or, and, and there's nothing wrong with any of that, but God's like, nah, you need to, you know, right now, best if you stay home and read the Bible, you know? Or if you want to, you know, go off and do something, God says, yeah, actually, right now, it's, it's best if you stay home and spend time with your kids or your wife. God will tell you, you know, your wife is feeling pretty lonely lately. Maybe you should spend some more time with her. Or the, the Lord will tell you, you know, your, your husband, he's, he's feeling insecure about himself. Maybe you can give him some, help give him some confidence and encourage him. The Lord will tell you these things. He'll tell you these things. We just got to be listening to him. And it's, important, and, it's, and it's really important that we listen to him before it's too late. Sometimes it can, you know, it can get too late to where the, the damage is already done. And, and, and you can always trust God at any time. Uh, whether the damage has been done or not. And, you know, God, how many of you know, I don't care what's going on. If, I'm, if, I'm, if I've been disobedient or laid on something, if I have faith in the grace of God, God's going to do something. Amen. He's going to do something. But earlier than later is, is better. <laughs> Praise God. Okay. So let's learn here about God's will. So let's go to 1 Corinthians 2.9. 2, 2, 1 Corinthians 2.9. First Corinthians two nine, and we're going to read through verses fourteen, through verse fourteen. All right. So, but as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of men the things which God has prepared for those who love Him. But God has revealed them to us through His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Spiritually discerned. Okay, so the first thing we need to see here is, uh, let's see, verse 11. Verse 11. For what man knows the things of a man except the Spirit? Even, it says, even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. No one knows the things of God except, somebody finish it for me? The Spirit of God, okay? So what does that mean? That means we don't know what God has for us. Right? That means our moms don't know what's, what's, what what's God has for us. Our, our dads don't know. Our grandparents don't know. Right? Our siblings don't know. Our pastor doesn't know what God has for us. Who knows? The Spirit of God. Now, the Spirit can use people to speak into your life by, by revelation or prophecy or encouragement and, and tell you, you know, this is... This is what God's will is for your life because they've heard from the Spirit of God. But no one knows the good things God has for you except for the Spirit of God. So what does that mean? Instead of us trying to figure out what God's will is, why don't we go to the source who knows what God's will is, which is the Spirit of God? Why don't we ask God what His will is? God, what, you know, i got a decision in front of me. What, what do you want me to do, God? The Spirit knows the good things that God has freely given to us. Amen? And it's not like he's withholding it from us, like, you know, you'll never find this. We've got it locked away in a safe in heaven. No, God, God is, he, he, man, he wants to give abundantly. He wants to bless you so much. But you've got to seek, and you've got to knock, and you've got to ask. Amen? Thank you, Lord. So no one knows except the Spirit of God the things that have been freely given to us by God. Hallelujah. Now let's go to Matthew 7, 11. Matthew 7, 11. Things that have been freely given to us by God. And this is where we really need to exercise our faith. And, and this ought to motivate us 
and push us to, to seek to be mindful of God's will and to understand or put together what his will is for us is because of these verses right here in Matthew 7, 11. If you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? How much more? Think about how much you love your child and how much you would do for them, how much you would give them. We would, wouldn't we give our kids the world if we could? How much more does God want to give good things to us? How much more? Hallelujah. That's the heart and will of God. In Romans 12, 2. Let's go to Romans 12, 2. I want to focus on the, the latter part of this verse. But it says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove... What, is, what, is the, what are the three words described that describe the will of God? Good, acceptable, and perfect. Why would we not be seeking after God's will? Why are we trying to figure out life on our own? Why are we trying to make our own decisions? Why are we living according to our own purpose when God says, I have a good and acceptable and perfect will for you? Amen? Why are we not seeking out his will more? This is what we need to be doing. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In verse 12, we have, now we, uh, in 1 Corinthians 2, 12, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These are the things that have been freely given to us by God. The good things, right? The acceptable things, the perfect things. But we've got to know these things that have been given to us. Some of us ask, well, my life isn't perfect or good or even acceptable, you know? Well, is it, that our life doesn't mean that what we're experiencing doesn't mean that that's God's will for us. Amen? We have to know what God has given us. We have to know the things that he has freely given us and freely blessed us with. Just like Sister Jill was talking about this morning. We have to learn to receive. And it takes just as much humility to receive as it does to give. Hallelujah. But in church, we've been taught that, you know, it's, we, we, we operate in a false humility by saying, no, 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 we, you know, we don't want to receive... We don't want to receive. And we think that's humility. That's a false humility. I want to receive. Thank you, Jesus. Because I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a child of the Almighty. And he has already given me good things. And I can share those good things with others. That's what we need to learn about. Life is not about us. It's not about us. You know, we're blessed to be a blessing. And if, if, if we're selfish to the point that we just, you know, we don't want to, well, you know, I don't want to be rich like, like some people, and I, I just want mine. Well, that's selfish thinking. That's not the will of God. That's not the plan God has for us. God wants us to be blessed to have enough to give. Amen? He's the God of abundance. So we need to get our mind off of, you know, just ourselves and what we have, and we need, to, we need to start thinking about the big picture, about why God's called us, what his will is. Amen. The Bible says that he's, in Ephesians, he's saved us for good works. What do you, why do you think he's, he's done that? Because he wants us to be a blessing. There's other people in this world who need him and need to receive the good things that he's given them. Amen. We need, there's a lot of, so many people who need peace, who need joy, who need, you know, restoration. They just need a word. They just need encouragement. They need somebody to believe in them, have confidence in them, because they never had anybody like that in their life. And that's what we're here for. Hallelujah. It's to affect change. For the kingdom of God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So it says there to receive the Spirit who is from God in verse 12, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. It says, These things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches. The Holy Spirit teaches us. Hallelujah. We won't receive God's good things that He's given us apart from the life lessons that the Holy Spirit teaches us. We need to be listening for the, for the Holy Spirit to teach us. We need to be looking for the Holy Spirit to teach us about life. So many of us are, are doing without because we are not looking to the helper that God has sent us to teach us and to help us in life. Amen? We should never live our life being satisfied with not knowing what God's will is. Hallelujah. We're not just out here just scattered. Uh, well, we're not supposed to be. <laughs> out here just scattered sheep just you know, buying our way, you know, bah, you know, not knowing which way direction we're going. Let's, let's look to the help of the Holy Spirit to guide us and to lead us. He's speaking to us, right? The Holy Spirit is teaching us, but we've got to be willing 
to listen to his voice. Hallelujah. The life lessons that the Holy Spirit teaches us, they add godly wisdom to our lives. They add godly wisdom, not, not man's wisdom, but godly wisdom to our lives. And they enable us to receive the good things that God has given us. Hallelujah. There is nothing in the world, nothing in the world that can help us receive the things that God has given us. There's nothing in the world. We need to be listening to the Holy Spirit and the life lessons that he's trying to teach us. Amen? Now, let me go back over here to Ephesians. Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. Now, let's focus there on verse 8. Let's go back to the top here. Ephesians 5, 8. It says, For you were once darkness. You were once darkness. So how many of you know that means that we're no longer darkness? Right? We're no longer darkness. Now, when I think of darkness, obviously, you don't know which direction you're going. Okay? Everything's, you're blinded to everything going on. And how it relates to us making good decisions and, and being mindful of the will of God and knowing what God's will is, is to me, you know, darkness, I wrote it down here, darkness means confusion, uh, being unsure, you know, what God's will is, being confused, not knowing which, which way is which, confusion, shame, uh, anxiety, depression, having a feeling of helplessness. You know, I think we've all been there. I know I've been there. There's been times where I've, I've felt shamed or I've felt anxious or I've felt helpless. But that is, to me, that's, that's darkness because, you know, if, you, if you're anxious, the reason you're anxious is because you see the problem but you don't know what to do to solve it. Or maybe you can't solve it. You can't do anything to help it. Right? If we're depressed, that means we're, we're, we're shamed. If we're depressed, that means, like, we have a dilemma in our hands and we don't know how to fix it. We, and we think there's no end to it. That's what brings on depression. And so that's all darkness, not being able to see, feeling helpless, feeling confused and shamed and anxious and all these things. That is darkness. And God says, you are no longer darkness. You were once darkness, but no longer. And I think it's time we start taking up who we are in Christ and being serious about that. Amen? Just like, just like God told us there in 1 Corinthians 2, it's through the Spirit of God that we know because he knows all things that God has given to us. Amen? And in order, if we're going to get out of our darkness, you know, we need to start getting close to the Holy Spirit and start looking to him. Hallelujah. For you were once darkness, but no longer. Thank you, Lord. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 14.33. 1 Corinthians 14.33. It says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. So, you know, what I've held on to in my life is I know if I'm confused, I know it's not from God. That's just, it's just very simple and clear for me. If I'm confused about what God wants me to do, what decision, what decision he wants me to make, I know it's not of God. And so what do I need to do? I need to start seeking God and, 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 and seeking clarification about what I'm supposed to do. Okay? Now, let's go to 1 John 1.5. 1 John 1.5. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light. What is God? He's light. In him is no darkness at all. No darkness. So what does that mean? Anytime I feel confused or shamed or anxious or depressed or helpless, that is not of God. Amen. Some of us, because of our religiousness... I'm not saying that to put anybody down. Because of our religiousness, we think that, you know, sometimes these things come from God because God is trying to teach us a lesson or God is trying to do something. God, there is no darkness in God. There is only light. What happens in the light? Everything is clear and out in the open, and you can see and you know where you're going. Amen? Amen? And so that's what God wants us, that's where God wants us to live in, is to live in the light. Because in God, there is no darkness, there is no shame or anxiety or depression or helplessness in God. But are we abiding in our strength, in our wisdom, in our will, or are we abiding in the light of God, which is His will revealed to us? Which is His grace revealed to us, His strength, His wisdom revealed to us. Where are we living at? Amen? Are we living in the darkness or living in the light? Hallelujah. That's the real question. 
So don't you ever think for one second that you're confused because God, because God willed it, that you don't know what his, what his will is, that, that you feel shamed or anxious or depressed or helpless because you know, God is just doing something in you that you're not sure of. Do not be mindless of the will of God, but put together what his will is. Amen? That's what God is calling us to do in the light. In the light is where the, the, the puzzle is put together. In the light is where we become mindful of the will of God by dwelling and, and, and living with his spirit who lives inside of us. Because the spirit will reveal it to us. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Those things do not come from God. What's important is for us to focus on the now. And the Bible says in First Corinthians, I'm sorry, Ephesians 5, 8, you were once darkness, but now, somebody say now. It doesn't matter what you once were. It doesn't matter what you once were. Now you are, it doesn't, it doesn't say here you have light. It says you are light in the Lord. Amen. Somebody say, I am. I am. Light in the Lord. Light. You are light in the Lord. And it says walk as children of light. Hallelujah. Let's go to John 8, 12. John 8, 12. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. The light of life. Let's learn with this life and light, the connection that they have. Let's go to 1 John uh, 1. 1 John 1, 1. Oh, not 1 John, I'm sorry. John 1, 1. I was like, wait a minute. That's not right. John 1, 1. Okay, we got it figured out now. There's a big difference between John and 1 John. How many of y'all know that? <laughs> okay, John 1.1, 1, 1. I love this. The connection between light and life. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Okay, so Jesus is God. I mean, how do you not see that? I don't know how people say, you know, Jesus is not God. Yeah, that's what the Pharisees were saying. That's why the Pharisees were so offended, because Jesus claimed to be God. Okay, he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Amen. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Hallelujah. So if you're dealing with shame and guilt and depression and anxiety, you just need some light in your life. Amen? And that should give you some hope right there. You just need some light. Stop allowing your conscience to tear you apart. Stop allowing, you know, religious teaching to put you down and make you feel less than. Stop allowing all, all these things to put you down. You need to listen to the Word of God. Because the Bible says here, in Him was life. Okay, so Jesus is the Word. So we can say, in the Word was life. And, the, and the, the life that is in the Word is the light of men. Where do we get the light to see clearly? In His Word. Amen? In His Word. In the Word was life, and the life that is in the Word is the light of men. The life that is in here is your guide in life. Amen? The life that is in here is your guide to help you see which direction you're going and which direction you're supposed to go. And I, I, don't, I hope that all of us are reading the word of God and looking to it for direction and guidance because it is impossible to fulfill the will of God apart from, from knowing and understanding his word. Nobody's calling you to be a Bible scholar, but you need to get in the word and you need to learn what God's will is for you and what his plan is for you. Amen? It's no wonder so many Christians are dwelling in darkness and confusion and shame because we're not allowing the life in the Word to be our light. We're not allowing the life in the Word to become who we are. Amen? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What's important for us is to focus on the now. Now we are light in the Lord. And the word is life, and the life is the light of men. Praise God. Praise God. <laughs> Let's go to 2 Timothy 3. 
2 Timothy 3.14. Thank you, Jesus. I want us to take a, take a look at this here. Praise God. I got my mind on, on one thing, and I'm over here. I need to focus on where I'm trying to go. Okay. 2 Timothy 3, 14. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of. What is it? Doesn't the Bible say, and we just read there in Corinthians, right? The Holy Spirit wants to teach us, right? But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. Now, let me make a point here. The Holy Spirit will not teach you if you're not in God's word. The Holy Spirit will not teach you if you're not in his word. The Holy Spirit uses the word to teach you. If you are not investing in your life with the word of God, the Holy Spirit will not teach you. He can't teach you. Because the Bible says that even if the Holy Spirit tries to teach you, the Bible says there in Corinthians, the natural man does not understand. So even if the Holy Spirit is talking to you and teaching you, it's just a bunch of gibberish because you're not understanding what he's saying. The, the word of God is not just some physical document. It is a spiritual uh, lesson, lessons given by God to us, given to us by God. Amen. And the Holy Spirit wants to use this spiritual manual to open up your spiritual heart and teach you something. Hallelujah. He wants us te to teach us something. So for verse 15, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness that the man of God may be complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is God-breathed. This is inspired by the Holy Spirit. This is how the Holy Spirit is going to teach us what we need to know to make good decisions, to walk in the will of God. And it is impossible for us to do that apart from his word. The Holy Spirit and the word are one. They're not separate. They're one. Amen? And if we really want the Holy Spirit to teach us, we have to get in his word and say, Holy Spirit, this is me opening myself up to you and allowing you to teach me the good things that God has freely given to me. Amen? And this will help you make good decisions in life that you can carry with you in life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, I want us to notice there, let's go back to Ephesians real quick. I got us going back and forth, huh? That's okay. Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. And, uh, <clears throat> oop, here we are. Verse 8 and 9, it says, you are now light, now walk as children of light. Okay, so in other words, we're not walking in the light hoping to become light. The Bible says we are light, therefore walk in the light. We need to be more confident in who we are in Christ. Amen. sometimes we're out there searching and seeking for answers. The Bible says you are light. What you need is inside of you. The Holy Spirit's inside of you. So don't don't. You know, walk, try to walk in the light in your own strength. And, and a lot, there's people who are trying to make good decisions, trying to figure out God's will for their life, and they're doing it in their flesh. They're doing it in their own wisdom. And that's not going to work. Amen. The Bible says you are light, therefore walk in the light. So recognize who you are as a child of God. You have the spirit within you. Rely on him. Amen. Now, verse 10. It says, walk, uh, verse 8, walk as children of light. Verse 10, finding out what is, accept, what is acceptable to the Lord, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Okay, so, so that means that we find out what's acceptable to the Lord by walking in the light. What is the light? The light is from, from the life in the, in the word of God. Amen? From his word. The light comes from his word. So if we are to walk at, so finding God's acceptable, remember Romans 12 too? Perfect, acceptable, and good. If we want to make good decisions and follow God's will that is acceptable, how do we find what, it's, what is acceptable to the Lord? Some are like, God, I don't know what your will is. I'm so confused. And, you know, it's causing anxiety. And, you know, 
I just, I just don't know what to do. God says, you find what's acceptable to the Lord by walking in the light. What does that mean? Seeing and obeying the life in the word of God. The life is the light of men. The life is the light. And the life is found in God's word. So how do we find out what's acceptable to God? You're in his word. You're in his word. And you're seeing the, the, the life lessons that the Holy Spirit is teaching you. You're seeing the life in his word. And you obey that. That is walking in the light. Amen? This is the source of our life, is it not? This is the source of our light. Because Jesus Christ is the word and he is the light of the world. So we are the light because he is the light in us. Hallelujah. This is the source of our light. So everything comes back to God's word. Everything. Knowing what his will is. Hallelujah. And if we begin to practice that and put that in, into practice in our life, we will see and understand that, that you know, we just, this, I'm just teaching you things right now, and this, all, this is all head knowledge, until you actually really get in God's word. See, this is not just meant to, you know, be just some Sunday message. If you start getting in God's word, I guarantee you, you will start knowing what God's will is for your life, and your life will change. Because in this word is life, and this life is light for your life. Amen? Thank you, Lord. So we find out what's acceptable to God by walking in the light, which is seeing and obeying God's word. In verse 11, it says here, they have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. So it's telling us there to be sanctified, be set apart from this world. Stop trying to fit in. Why, why are we trying to fit in so much with the world? We are not going to fit in with the world. God has called us to, to you know, be a blessing to the world, but we are not going to fit in with the world. No matter how hard we try, if, and, and, and if we are going to fit in with the world, we're going to have to compromise God's word. Amen? And that's not something that I'm willing to do. Hallelujah. In 2 Corinthians 6.17, 2 Corinthians 6.17, what does it say there? God says, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. What separates us from the world, what sets us apart, is the word of God. The word of God. In God is light. There is no darkness at all. We are the light, the world is darkness. What separates us? What's the difference between the light and the darkness? The word of God. The life of God found in his word. That is the light. Amen? That's what separates. If, if we are not in God's word, we will find ourselves being just like the world. Not only will we find ourselves being just like the world, we will find ourselves persecuting our brothers and sisters for standing up for God's word. There are many carnal Christians who are persecuting Christians who are led by the spirit of God. Why are they doing that? Because they're not allowing the life of God's word to become their light. They're saved, they're going to heaven, but they're carnal. And they persecute their brothers and sisters because all their brothers and sisters are trying to do is stand up for God's word and stand up for righteousness and holiness and trying to stand up for, what, for the life found in here. But they're persecuting their brothers and sisters. Why? Because they're not in God's word, allowing his life to become their light. Amen? May we never find ourselves in that position. May we get in God's word and allow the Holy Spirit to teach us and be transformed. Be transformed. Hallelujah. How many of you want to be transformed? It doesn't come by your effort or your strength. It comes by the life and the word of God. Amen? Thank you, Lord. Verse 13, Ephesians 5, 13. We're, we're, we're at the end here. But in all things, I'm sorry, but all things that are exposed, we made... Um, are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Okay, so all the evil things are made manifest by the light. Now the word, um, so we know here that we are the light, okay, we are light. So light brings manifestation, doesn't it? It just says here, they're made manifest by the light. The light brings manifestation. Now to, to when it says that the light brings manifestation, that, that word manifest can be translated as well from the Greek to make apparent, to make apparent, which is clearly visible or clearly understood. The light makes things very visible and understood for us to grab a hold of, because if we don't understand something, we're not going to be able to latch on to that. The word of God gives us vision for our life to see what God's will is so we can grab onto that. God has given us faith through his word so we can latch on to his promises by faith. But if we are not seeing uh, what, what God wants us to see in his word for our life, then we, there's nothing to grab onto. 
There's no hope. And that's what hope, faith latches on to hope. Hallelujah. Without hope, faith is, has, no, has no purpose. If you, if you have faith with no hope, you, ha, you know there's nothing for faith to latch on to. Amen? Amen. So hope is, is, is the God telling us, this is what I've promised you, this is what I've given you, and faith latches on to that, to receive that and walk in that. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We must awaken, as it says here, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. We must awaken to this light by fellowshipping with his spirit, as we read in Corinthians, who knows all things that God has given to us. We must fellowship with the spirit of God through the word that is God-breathed, because apart from God's word, the Holy Spirit cannot teach us. The Holy Spirit will use the God-breathed word of God to teach you and lead you into God's perfect will for your life and to help you make good decisions one right after another. Amen? Let's go ahead and stand this morning. Thank you, Jesus. It is through the word, through the lessons taught to us by the Holy Spirit, that godly wisdom is added unto us, and we are able to walk in the good plans mapped out for us by God. Hallelujah. And lastly here it says, in verse 16, Redeeming the time because the days are evil. What does that word redeem mean? It can be translated to to rescue from loss. To rescue from loss. How do we make our lives count? By redeeming the time. By looking to the Holy Spirit to teach us life lessons, to guide us and lead us in the perfect, acceptable will of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. It all comes back to God's word. Amen? It all comes back. That's why, you know I, know, I know in church we emphasize, you know, we need to read God's word, but we need to understand why do we need to read God's word? Because in this is the life. Amen? In this is the life, and the life is your light. Hallelujah. And don't just read this with a religious mindset, but read it with a, an open mindset, listening to what the Holy Spirit is telling you. You will get revelation. You will get the answers to what you've been seeking, the problems that you've been having, the struggles you've been having. This is is the revelation that you need to be free from that. Amen? Father God, I pray this morning that we would put faith in your word. That we would put faith, God, in who you are. That we put faith in your spirit. That your spirit is sent to help us. Jesus was so excited when he left that the Holy Spirit could come and indwell in all of your children all at one time. And, and be our compass and, and love us and reveal your love to us, God. May we wake up and stop being ignorant and mindless, but start understanding and being mindful and putting together what your will is by allowing the Holy Spirit to teach us and bring to light the life that is in your word. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I pray that we be faithful faithful to what he shows us, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. This morning, we're going to go ahead and take communion. Amen. And um, from everybody I see, I believe everybody's saved. Thank you, Jesus. So I don't think I need to do an altar call. So you need to go grab some people out there and bring them in here. Bring them to the altar. Amen. Now, honestly, though, you know, be, just invite somebody. Invite somebody, whether it be a friend or a family member. That way they can be blessed by this. Praise God. So we're going to take communion now. We're going to honor what the Lord has, has done for us. So you feel everybody will come up and uh, we will begin honoring the Lord's death and resurrection.